hello everyone. Uh, my name is Koichi Kikuchi, uh, organizer of this session. Uh, now I would like to start our session, uh, Governance of Space Activities. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to say many thanks to GNF uh, staff. Uh, thanks to their continued support, we are here today. Uh, also, I want to say many thanks to the audience uh, for coming here. Uh, then, uh, we are very sorry uh, that uh, Professor Shiroyama had to go back to Japan and uh, left DC yesterday. And um, uh, Dr. Takaya uh, also couldn't uh, DC this time. And uh, I and Miss Motoko Mizuno will take over uh, Professor Shiroyama, Shiroyama's role as a moderator. Uh, I will make opening remarks on behalf of him, and Ms. Mizuno uh, will be a moderator of panel discussion. And now, uh, opening remarks uh, by uh, Professor uh, Hideaki Shirayama. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's our great honor to join the uh, 70th uh, ISE this year, uh, which marks the 50th anniversary of the first human step on the moon. Uh, thank you, uh, GNF uh, Secretariat. Thank you, audience. And thank you, speakers. Uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, the University of Tokyo's Graduate School of Public Policy, uh, in short, GRASP, GRASP, which offers a Master of, of Public Policy uh, degree, uh, aims to train students in planning, implementing, and uh, evaluating public policy and to prepare students for careers in public service. GRASP offers a university-wide program named Science, Technology, and Innovation Governance, uh, in short, uh, STIG, STIC, that harnesses specialized graduate school-level education in humanities and sciences. STIG fosters human resources uh, who can lead science and technology governance with knowledge of science, technology, and innovation policy making process, and knowledge of the uh, evidence building methods required to draft and implement policies, including uh, uh, space policy. When it comes to current global space activities, governance is a key topic because of increase of spacefaring nations and the emerge of new space companies. Space-related treaties enacted through 1960s and 1970s are applied to government space activities and based on the, the assumption that uh, commercial businesses are subject to government supervision. Uh, new space companies, however, are exacting, exacting space activities with their own visions and business models. They contribute to vitalizing global space activities with their business proposals like mega constellation or space resource exploration. On the other hand, concerns regarding sustainability of space activities by human beings are expressed because of the gradual and, and uh, unexpected increase of space debris. Continuous space activities, infrastructure, or maintaining basis of space industries are still considered to be governmental tasks. This session aims to share the results of comparative studies on national space policy and law. We would like to share the common understanding of the challenges and the possible global space governance, where space agencies and private companies will maximize their potentials and realize sustainable space activities by human beings. We believe we need further studies on space policy and law. We would like to use this global networking forum as an opportunity to broaden our study network by meeting, sharing, and con connecting. Thank you. And uh, this slide is uh, a part of material uh, Professor Shiroyama is using for our course, uh, space, uh, space Development and Public Policy. So uh, it's a uh, study results of the comparative uh, study on the space agencies, uh, JAXA and CUNES and DLR. I want to skip the contents uh, today, 
But、uh, if you are interested in、uh, such studies,、uh, please tell us. Thank you. And then、uh, we will have、uh, a keynote speech uh, from uh, uh, Professor von der,、uh, Franz von der Blank,、uh, Sensei uh, from uh, Nebraska University. So please.、Uh, Thank you very much for that.、Um, thank you also to the University of Tokyo for inviting me here. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important subject which I think we addressed already a number of years ago in a seminar at your university in, in some detail、uh, the governance of space activities. Um, now, as a lawyer, I always prefer to try and define what we talk about. And we should be clear that governance is not the same as government, because if it would be the same, we wouldn't need a different term, right? So that's why it is important to realize that we are not only talking about governments. Governance is a broader issue, it's a concept of the exercise of authority and control. By way of a method or system which includes, of course, governments, which includes law, but can also have more、uh, ephemeral managerial elements, the management of activities of other entities and, of course, notably of the private sector. So, governments of space activities is basically about the use of governmental powers to control the private sector activities in space, and space is an international area. Which brings it, it, with it a number of different parameters. If, if, if a government has to exercise governance in its own territory, it's pretty straightforward because the government is in control. But in an international area, it becomes broader, and that's why you make this distinction with governance. Now, there are maybe four major parameters to how states, how governments can exercise their、uh, authority and control in outer space. The most important one is, of course, Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which says that there is no exercise of territorial sovereignty in outer space, meaning indeed that no single country can act as if outer space is part of national territory. And it means that governments cannot act as such either, cannot uh, pro, uh, provide the law and,、um, and the obligations for that area. Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty sort of Conversely, then make states responsible also for private activities in space,、uh, which is pretty unique, and actually requires them to authorize and supervise those activities. So that's where we get into the governance issue how, what system of authorization and supervision is actually being applied in, in, in real life. Uh, and to back this up, there's a final article, and I won't、uh, bother you with、uh, detailed legal clauses anymore, but there is a final article in the Outer Space Treaty, Article 7, which deals with、uh, liability, making states liable for damage, including if caused by private space activities. That article has been further elaborated in the Liability Convention, but the baseline for all this is that states, therefore, are actually pressed. To exercise their governmental functions, their governance authority to control these activities because the states will be held responsible and liable if something goes wrong. So, the normal way of doing that is national space legislation because that's where you can authorize and supervise to take care of your responsibility and liability. Now, if we had more time, we could play fun with flags, but this is basically. The number of states in the world as of today having a full fledged national space law. You see, it started actually 50 years ago with Norway. You see many large countries in there. You see a number of smaller countries in there. And of course, there are still many countries which are not there at all. So, to give you some of the Uh, countries which are about to have a national space law、uh, that includes our host of today, Japan,、uh, where I saw in the slide of、uh, Dr. Kikuchi al 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 already a reference to this.、Um, but it is not there yet. And then, what the comparative uh, uh, analysis does, or what I did by way of a comparative analysis of those national space legislations, is fundamentally address the approach. To how to exercise control, how to authorize and supervise. 
And there are basically, in theory, four approaches. The one approach is that you say every space activity conducted from national territory requires an authorization. So you apply it to everyone operating on your territory doing something in outer space. Whether it's a national entity or a foreign entity, that is what we call in the legal profession territorial jurisdiction. The exercise of control over your territory to license, authorize, supervise, etc. these private activities. Now in a sense that concept of territorial jurisdiction is kind of extended because what we see happening nowadays is space activities undertaken from ships, such as sea launch, or undertaken from underneath aircraft. We have, uh, for example, Pegasus, a company which launches satellites into outer space from underneath aircraft. Now, if these ships or aircraft carry a national flag, they are seen as what we call pieces of quasi-territory of the country at stake. And of course, if the flag is a US flag, the United States can license whatever the, uh, is undertaken from the ship or from the, uh, from the aircraft carrying its flag. The third approach is a, a rather different one that goes back to the nationality of the operators. So if a US national operates a space activity anywhere in the world, that can also be made subject to US national law. That is what we call personal jurisdiction. And then space law offers a final and fourth approach, adding on to the quasi-territorial approach. It basically says, well, if you register a satellite, oh, I'm sorry, my, uh, I was the, the, in my original slides, I, this was supposed to float into the register, because the idea is that you register a satellite, and by doing that, you also create control, legal control over that satellite. That's also what we call basically quasi-territorial jurisdictions. So in theory, those are the four tools that states have to exercise authority, exercise governance activities over uh, space activities by the private sector. Now, unfortunately, there's not enough time to go through all of them, but I can give you the summary of the comparative study of all these national space laws. Here you see in the first line the first set of countries, and what immediately becomes clear is that the US, for example, has three types of national space legislation, which to a different extent cover these four approaches. Some of them use territory, some of them use nationals, apply to nationals, and none of them explicitly applies to space objects. If you go down the line, you see the United Kingdom and South Africa equally having separate approaches in this regard. Going further down the line, you see here an interesting country, namely Brazil, basically the first developing country, which is very much focused on launching only and focused on using its territory only, which again reads that the Brazilian legislation says you need an authorization, you need a license if you launch from Brazilian territory. And of course, in the license, the Brazilian authorities can do whatever they feel is necessary to control those activities, to exercise governance in outer space, if you will. Canada has an act just like Germany on satellite remote sensing only. Um, and again, you know, the basic takeaway message is here that every country takes their own approach. So there is unfortunately no global similarity in approach to how you exercise governance. And I can imagine that the Japanese legislators may be confused about what is the best choice for them. I would suggest all four, but that's just me as an academic. To wind up, we have uh, in France a double approach. We see here a, a, a second developing country, Nigeria. Uh, we have here some more recent acts. And the only thing which you can now see gradually appearing that is with the later acts, because this is all chronological, you see more complete approaches. That's also partly why I would suggest Japan to, to, uh, to follow this, at least as a baseline. You see more and more that all the four quarters are being occupied, although it's not yet completely consistent. I will stop there and give you a few of my concluding remarks. As I said, the more recent national space laws are, the more coherent, in a sense, they are, and the more comprehensive they are in exercising governance, exercising governmental authority and control over these activities in outer space. And at least they do that on the basis of territory, 
all activities from national territory are subject to that. And on a personal jurisdiction basis, meaning that any national, including national companies, is subject to those requirements. In particular in Europe, which is of course easy because European countries are, are, are used to working together in international contexts. Think about the European Union or the European Space Agency. They have a lot in common in terms of history and economics. But it's probably, hopefully, going to apply to the rest of the world as well. But there is still a considerable measure of divergence. Many important countries are still missing altogether. As I said, well, I put Japan there first, again, to honor our guests. But of course, you see China, Pakistan, Malaysia, Vietnam, Mexico, and Argentina, to just quote some of the other major countries missing. With that, I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Franz, for the very comprehensive presentation, keynote speech. And now we are entering into uh, panel dis discussion stage. But before entering the each individual presentation, I just would like to uh, share the background of this session. Uh, sorry, before that, uh, that first one, please. Ah, do you? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so background of this session was the United, uh, University of Tokyo Space Policy Initiative, which started from 2010. That background was a proposal from JAXA. Uh, my name is Motoko Mizuno, working for JAXA and at the same time a uh, lecturer of University of Tokyo. Uh, JAXA as a space agency, we need more uh, wider information and knowledge and also the people networking uh, in order to set our vision and re regulations and so on. So we propose, JAXA proposed University of Tokyo a uh, joint project for space policy and research project. That, was, that is UTSPI, the name after uh, GWSPI, that is good, uh, GWSPI, uh, former head of Professor Pace, a good advisor to create that kind of activities. UTSPI, in collaboration with JAXA, we have two, uh, three functions, research, ed education, and outreach. So uh, UTSPI, in collaboration with JAXA, try to get more wider network of space policy, law, and uh, policy and law research academic field. First, we uh, have good cooperation with GWSPI, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, Nebraska University, von der Dank, Professor von der Dank, kindly joined our sessions in Tokyo. Also, we have good cooperation with UN USA and SPIC in European field universities. They kindly join our workshop in Tokyo. And also we have good collaboration with IISL Academic Society, but we found that we need, not only in Japan, we need more uh, wider network with Asia Pacific region. So we created under the uh, advisor from IISL, Tanya and Dr. Schroger of IISL president, uh, we created SPRANAP, uh, Space Policy and Law Academic Network in Asia Pacific region. That was uh, strongly supported by NIA our Indian colleague, Dr. Lau. So that was my, our background, and we set first our research subject as UTSPI, the governance uh, from comparative studies. So that is the, our, our uh, background of today's uh, session. So each one will uh, provide uh, their knowledge or experience for, of uh, governance uh, uh, of space activities. So first presentation, ah, sorry, I have one missing. So one more action in Japan is JSAS, uh, Japanese, Japan Society for Aeronautical and Space Science, uh, newly established space and policy committee headed by myself and Kikuchi-san. And then we uh, start, started uh, to promote space run policy study in academic society in Japan. So JSAS just set space vision 2050 like pictures in 2000. 50, we can create the kind of age of near the, near the Earth that ordinary people can travel, uh, easily travel near the Earth, and the moon base or Mars base, and the deep space, maybe not with manned project, but without manned project, we can, robot project, we can uh, access 
to deep space is the JSA Space Vision in 2050. And myself and Kikuchi-san contribute to set up policy and law and culture roadmap. And we uh, proposed at least eight legal challenges uh, to to overcome in order to uh, to, uh, to realize that this space vision 2050, that these are eight. So more flexible international lawmaking process, the uh, uh, consensus system of UN copiers is uh, we, we, how we can manage more flexible international lawmaking process is one thing, and two, two things is governance, uh, good governance for private space activities, mainly by domestic laws, regulations. And three, uh, third point is uh, of course, that the flexible domestic law system, we have to change our domestic laws to fit to newest space activities and then other legal measures or public measures like PPP, like things, to promote private space activities have to be developed. And of course, sustainability of space activities, and then we have to think about the treatment of moon, Mars, Mars, base and also the space resource mining. And finally, we have to think about the new legal concept beyond OST regime, uh, how we can create the jurisdiction in the life in the moon and, moon and Mars. That is the uh, eight uh, legal challenges set by uh, JSS. So that is the background of our study in Japan and the study of the uh, study network of the UTSPI. So uh, next, uh, next slide is my presentation for this session. So uh, my, 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 uh, my uh, research subject is nowadays the space resources governance. So, uh, you know that the Outer Space Treaty, there are no prohibition of the space mining at, uh, 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 of the uh, commercial space mining, like the IISL positioning paper in 2015, absence of a clear prohibition of the taking of resources, then the use of space resource is permitted. That is main basic understanding of uh, space lawyers. And then we have to think about the soft law, uh, even, even though it is soft law, but we have to think about space benefit declaration, UNG resolution in 1996 to balance the benefit uh, in, in, uh, con with consideration for the needs of developing countries. So the, there are three points, and uh, not the financial sharing, but the uh, sharing of the benefit with uh, capacity building like that. Ooh. So now we are come to the Moon Agreement. Moon Agreement, uh, we have, uh, there, there is the uh, common heritage mankind concept. Uh, that so, so the natural resource shall not become property, uh, but without prejudice to the inter international regime to be established. It means once the international regime established, they can change the uh, condition uh, under the Moon Agreement. So there are room for the property right is the point we have to consider about. And then the CHM, the Common Heritage of Mankind concept, was uh, introduced in 1967, before outer space, uh, 1967. Uh, so that is for the seabed, uh, for the uh, seabed, uh, uh, proposed for the seabed. So UN Convention on the Law of the Sea detailed the uh, CHM idea uh, for international authority will develop the uh, seabed, seabed resources on behalf of human beings. But the Moon Agreement uh, not detailed such, so we can, we, we can uh, develop the new uh, regime after Moon Agreement is one thing. And then also the Outer Space Treaty, because it is before the CHM idea, so there are no concept of CHM. So this is detail, so I will skip. So now that, uh, uh, now that no provision in Outer Space Treaty, so uh, for the non-space party of Moon Agreement uh, can proceed uh, moon, uh, space resource mining under domestic law regulations. So United States and Luxembourg set domestic laws and then uh, clearly declare the uh, uh, private uh, uh, light for possessed uh, the space resources and then setting conditions for licensing. 
And on the other hand, uh, there are the uh, uh, activity to uh, establish international regime to govern the space resource activities headed by Netherlands, who is the uh, space party for Moon Agreement, the Hague International Space Resource Governance. So they uh, they said proposing the uh, under the building blocks, they are proposing that the. Uh, 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 legislation system and priority rights, and then clearly declaring, declare, declare, declaring that the uh, uh, space resources are lawfully acquired. And then one point I should take point is to, uh, to third, uh, they proposing international framework should not require uh, monetary benefit sharing. So it seems for me uh, this is more favorable condition for space mining operator uh, rather than the space benefit declaration by UNGA. So final, my final paper is this. Um, this is my understanding of the governance uh, for the space, uh, space, space resources. Uh, as you know, that the, it, is, it is under the de development. So today's governance is not clear. We have to create now for that uh, governance for space resources. At, but anyway, uh, outer space treaty, no provision. So uh, taking into consideration for soft law, space benefit declaration, uh, outer space treaty Treaty, uh, member states can proceed under domestic laws and uh, under regulation uh, of the uh, domestic laws for, by, for the companies uh, for the space resource in mining. Uh, so, but they, if they think the international regime need or uh, maybe soft law like UNG resolution, additional resolution uh, can be required. But it is uh, under the under the. Uh, consensus base in United Nations. On the other hand, for the 12 state parties from Moon Agreement, uh, they need anyway international regime. Uh, so uh, I don't know which uh, is based on bi base building blocks of Hague initiative or not, but anyway, they have to create international regime to uh, proceed space resource mining. So in case, the, uh, in order to uh, establishment of uh, international regime, I, my, I, my, my uh, expectation is which should be the additional treaty because which supersede the Moon Agreement Article 11. And if the Moon Agreement non-state party needs to enter uh, Moon agree agreement before entering international regime, then it might be uh, plenty of time to coordination for uh, to, to, to entering into two treaties, and then maybe the before the establishing uh, uh, international regime, it takes two time is my is challenges. That is my my presentation. Thank you very much. Next, uh, I would like to make uh, my short presentation uh, about the uh, comparative study on financing function of space agencies. Um, this is content. And first of all, uh, why financing function now? Uh, one of the reasons is emerge of uh, new space companies. Uh, originally, uh, national space activities have been uh, executed like uh, left chat and uh, government set vision or policy, and space agencies Im implement project or program. Uh, private sector delivers products uh, or, or services. Uh, however, um, new space companies, in my definition, uh, have their own vision or business model. They don't necessarily obey a national uh, vision or, or program. Then uh, the questions are raised. Uh, how to collaborate with new space, how to vitalize uh, space, agent, uh, space industries. Financing function may be one of the, uh, these, uh, the answers to these questions. And this is overview of study results. Uh, today I skip it uh, and show the details. Uh, first, JAXA, uh, in Japan, uh, an act related to uh, science and technology and innovation uh, enacted, uh, en enabled some of the national research and development agencies to invest uh, agency-derived ventures, uh, venture capital uh, that support such ventures, and or uh, technology licensing organization. JAXA doesn't have this function for now, uh, but JAXA can have it uh, if this uh, act is uh, 
this act is uh, revised. Uh, on the other hand, uh, JAXA is collaborating with government-related banks. Uh, JAXA gives them technical uh, advice, uh, and in 2018, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe launched a new platform to invest space ventures, including this framework. Um, this is a, a citation from uh, Space News about a uh, new platform in Japan. Uh, I skipped the details of this uh, new platform today. And then uh, United States. Um, NASA, uh, NASA Act uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, 1958 uh, authorizes NASA to take other transactions. Uh, which enables NASA to make uh, agreement without obeying uh, federal acquisition regulations. Uh, this agreement is called uh, Space Act Agreement, SAA. SAA is applied to uh, uh, commercial orbital transportation services, COT, and uh, uh, commercial crew development, CCDEV, uh, these programs, and grants for fundamental research. In fact, um, SA enables flexible agreement. Um, I personally call SA as Denka no Hoto in Japanese. Uh, that is Japanese uh, sword handed generation by generation in one family. Uh, anyway, uh, NASA can support private company with this uh, SA. And of course, uh, uh, the uh, U.S. space companies uh, receive uh, public funding. This is a citation from uh, a Space Angels report. Uh, today I don't have time, so I will skip uh, it. Then uh, France, CUNES. Uh, CUNES can participate in indus industries uh, in financial manner by uh, CUNES Establishment Act. Um, Kunes is uh, famous uh, as the founder of uh, uh, Ariane Space and the Spot Image. However, uh, after French Space Operations Act was enacted in uh, uh, 2018, um, and because of uh, concerns about benefit conflict, they sold shares uh, to private companies, uh, respectively. On the other hand, CUNES launched a venture capital, capital fund called Cosmic Capital. Uh, CUNES is collaborating with uh, ESA in this framework. And this is a citation from ESA News. Uh, they say uh, the creation of pa partnership between industry, government, and academia is key to exploiting the fast growing ecosystem of new space companies that have a focus on uh, rapid innovation, new business models, and new application of space technologies. Uh, we can see uh, the similar awareness with us here. Then, uh, as for the framework uh, or consortium for space venture capital, uh, Seraphim uh, of Europe is a uh, precedent. And UKSA is collaborating with ESA in this framework. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting uh, framework, but uh, I skip with uh, the details of uh, Seraphim today. This is uh, uh, from uh, uh, Seraphim uh, homepage. Uh, the companies they are investing now. Um, now, uh, consideration. Uh, as a trend, uh, risk money, uh, that means uh, high risk and high return uh, investment, uh, in two uh, space ventures, ventures market globally. Um, uh, globally. And we can see the shift uh, from uh, capital investment by space agency to framework or consortium uh, type investment. Then governance questions are raised. Uh, what will be the roles of space agencies? Uh, who needs uh, innovation? Uh, space agencies should focus, focus more on infrastructure 
who should care sustainability of space activities? Uh, such questions are raised. Um, here, uh, as for uh, infrastructure, for example, uh, NASA's Deep Space Gateway is an inf infrastructure through which uh, private companies and uh, international partners uh, can implement their missions. So maybe we can discuss uh, NASA's Deep Space Gateway uh, in, such, in such trend or uh, context. That's all uh, about my uh, study. Thank you. Then, uh, next, uh, last. Thank you. Thank you, Mutoko, and thank you, Kifil-san, and to all of you for uh, being in this session. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell some general aspects of what is happening in the policy world of space. Uh, how does a nation look at policy and law as far as space is concerned? How do regional uh, nations or regional bodies look at policy? And what are the global imperatives that are emerging in, as far as policy is concerned? Uh, this is a, an outcome of a study that uh, we have been doing in India, in uh, National Institute of Advanced Studies, along with the University of Tokyo. And uh, we feel that uh, the policy world is going to see a lot of change. If, if, if technology is driving space into new space, uh, I think policy studies will also see a, a emergence of a new scenario of making policies of something like a new space policy. Uh, just to give a feel, what does the nation do as far as policy is concerned? This is what is India's space uh, activities in that sense. India does not have its stated policy or a law, uh, as was uh, mentioned by uh, France earlier. Uh, it is in the process of making a law, uh, 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 policy, but uh, there has never been a stated statement or a stated document which says this is the Indian space policy. In spite of that, in the last 45 to roughly 50 years, India has made tremendous progress as far as space is concerned. So space has always been seen within India as a tool for national development. So that has been the sort of driver policy, space for national development. So anything that requires national development and if space can support it, that would be the direction that India would take as far as space is concerned. So, so that has been the core, core sort of uh, uh, point for, for India's vision, uh, which was established by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai in, in the early 70s uh, time frame. But over the time, it is also becoming a high-end technological capability where India is able to exercise its, its high-end technology, show how efficiently space can be done, how cost-effectively it can be done with the various missions that it has already demonstrated across the world. It also has given India an autonomous access to space. So we feel that nations look at autonomous access to space as a very important element. And most of the nations that have uh, sort of grown in space have, have taken this step and, and recognized the importance of autonomous access to space, just like India has done. And slowly, the commercial enterprise of the space industry, the space private sector is becoming prominent. Even in India, it's becoming prominent, though uh, there are still issues of how private sector will participate in Indian space and what, the, what they would do. But commercial activities in space is becoming a very important regime for the furtherance of space in the coming years. Uh, similarly, international cooperation, I think, will always be at yet another core of, of policy definition as far as space is concerned, uh, be it in um, uh, satellite building or be it for launch or be it for services or be it for applications or whatever. But international cooperation, uh, just like uh, autonomous access to space by any nation, international cooperation is yet another very important parameter that nations look for as far as policy definition and space activities are concerned. So with these core issues that India has evolved over time, it has built up a large amount of programs in satellite communications, it has its own launch program, it provides launch services to many other nations in the world, it has uh, remote sensing and earth observation applications, it has a, its own positioning and navigation system uh, satellites that are there, and it has also a variety of applications for national development. Uh, I'm not going to go into those details in that sense. But off late in the last 10 years or so, India has also emerged into the planetary science, studying the moon or going to the moon, Mars mission and other activities, which is the interest after a first level 
uh, achievement in space, any nation would want to get into the higher levels of uh, knowledge building and technological capability. And this is what India has also done with a successful mission to the moon earlier and also to Mars uh, uh, in the recent times. And it has also announced the next step towards uh, sending humans into space. So a human space flight mission has also been opened up. So we see that a nation looks at space from some core aspects, which is highlighted in this slide, but it slowly evolves and builds the capabilities that are required from rudimentary issues to satellite building, to rockets, to applications, to navigation systems, to humans in space flight, planetary, and so on. So this is like a profile. It opens up a, a number of activities that nations take up in this uh, scenario. And this is what India has done. And I'm sure if we look at many other nations, this is exactly the pattern that one will see. There is something core, and around the core builds, and then it evolves uh, sort of and furthers in, into growth as far as space is concerned. Looking at a regional perspective, we did a study to trying to compare the space policy or the space activities of different nations in the Asia-Pacific region. We did a study with the University of Tokyo. Motoko and Shiroima-san were also one of the key elements of this particular study. And we saw that you know, in Asia-Pacific, for example, Japan and India uh, have tremendous progress achieved as far as space is concerned. There's also another nation, China, which is very active and it has tremendous uh, capabilities in space. But then there are many other smaller nations that are slowly emerging and wanting to define their space policy, their national space programs. We studied various nations, and I just give some small examples here. You will find the details of uh, some of the studies that we have done in, in, in the reports and the papers of uh, IAF Congress in the previous sessions. Uh, for example, Malaysia, uh, Philippines, Singapore, we know that Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, they're all looking at space, uh, space activities and also defining space uh, policy for, for, for their own uh, requirement. But the maturity that Japan and India have sort of built over the years reflects in the program that it has and the type of policy that it, it caters to. Um, we see that Japan has some space law, which was defined in 2015 and earlier in 2008 and uh, later on in 2015. India still does not have a space law or a space policy. It's still in the process of defining it. But then Philippines has already defined a space act. You know, it has, it has very clearly defined what it wants to do and what are the activities that it will take up as part, as part of a policy and legal frame is concerned. Similarly, Malaysia has put up a draft for, of a space policy that it wants to take up. And Singapore says that they are under work for this activity. And they identified different things. Focus is always infrastructure applications. That's, that's the core of most of the, the policy definitions that have been there, whether it is remote sensing, earth observation, or whatever, and the whole thing. Uh, nobody straight away says uh, we want to send humans to the moon. So, so it starts with a small step and then it, it migrates into higher levels of uh, capabilities. Uh, space capabilities also varies in most of these nations. Uh, Japan and India along with China are one level and the other nations are at different levels of capability in that activity. The other point is everybody recognizes international cooperation. We have studied this, we have seen that everybody says that international cooperation is a very important ele element in the Asia Pacific region for policy, either at a bilateral level or at a multilateral framework level. And we have seen many of the activities that are done under uh, UNSCAP, under APRSAF, under other multilateral forums that are, for, uh, that are being created. There's a high amount of international cooperation that is highlighted. So this is just to say, to show that these are the type of activities that that are sort of seen in the overall context of policy making in different countries. So if we, based upon these studies, we did identify some few topics which are very important for collaboration and international participation in space cooperation in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, it could be, for example, in satellite positioning and navigation, there's a lot of interest. There is an interest for making joint space missions. Already India and Japan are talking of joint space missions to be done in the future. And many other nations are also talking of uh, building small satellites and other navigation uh, systems in that uh, particular thing. There's also an interest in ISS utilization. In the Asia Pacific region, many nations want to participate in the International uh, Space Station so th and exploration related activities. So, so there's an interest of, uh, uh, for many nations in the region. Space robotics was identified as a very key area where collaboration could be taken up at different levels by different agencies. And of course, also industrial collaboration of private sector and other activities. So by doing such studies of comparative thing and learning from the national space programs and national space policies, it is possible to identify such cooperative activities which can help a regional space policy to emerge in that overall context. 
But if you look at global scenario today, uh, there are some very f new things that are happening, you know, which we are seeing as part of the new space activities. And we need to keep this in mind in the overall international law and international policy framework and also at the national level and the uh, regional level. The low cost access to space is really disrupting the overall scenario. So everybody now can afford to have access to space, either on your own or through somebody else on the whole thing. And various types of private sector uh, initiatives are coming up, and these are going to change the policy directions and law directions in, in the coming years. Constellation systems, earth observation and communication, large number of satellites, 600 satellites for communication, 800 satellites for earth observation, so small satellites, and so large number of constellation systems are coming up, which are going to create other types of issues related to debris, space governance, space management, and other activities. Yeah, and uh, we, we, we have other activities like planetary action that you know like a planetary uh, exploration activities that are going to be taken up debris removal these are some issues that are coming up in a big way and of course gateways to outer space you know going out of space into into farther outer space activities is going to be a major activity which are coming up in the global domain so finally my last slide is that if if we have to look at the imperatives for policy definition in the coming years I think recognizing that nations will make their own space policy, which will include space agency as well as the new space initiative, that is the industrial activity associated, is, is very important. Each nation is going to look at it in that manner as to what should be space policy, and we have to, we have to keep that in mind in the imperatives for uh, uh, future uh, space policy related research and activities. A caring and protecting Earth, I think, is going to be common. It's going to be common across nations to look at how to care for the Earth, uh, our planet Earth, and our, how to protect its activities. I think in the coming years, humans on Mars and Moon is going to be uh, Moon and Mars is going to be a reality. We are we have seen the declarations that have been made. So, what is going to be the implication of this? new activity where humans will be on moon, they'll be on Mars, what will it mean as far as policy is concerned, space policy is concerned and space law is concerned, I think needs to be debated and discussed in the overall things. And industrialization of space, whether you manufacture, space tourism, industry uh, activities on space, I think is going to be on another major activity that one will have to consider. And there is going to be one more activity of space warfare. Hopefully not that it should become a reality, but every nation is going to consider this issue as to what is going to be meaning by militarization of space and space warfare related activities. So from an overall perspective, we feel some of these things have to be researched. There's a lot of studies that need to be done before we define the policies for the future. What we have is of the past definitions, but what we need now in the global imperative that I just now defined is something very, very different. And I think we need a lot of uh, studies and cooperative activities and fora like this, which has been organized, I think will be very good for exchanging information and building ideas for the future. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Quentin Verspiren. I'm a researcher at the University of Tokyo. Uh, let me move the slides. Okay. So I have basically two research topics. Was, one is uh, space traffic management uh, from the point of view of the military forces of big space uh, countries that I presented yesterday. And so today I will focus on my second topic, which is uh, space policy in developing countries and in particular in ASEAN. Why do I think that it's important to talk to you about ASEAN? ASEAN has three unique points. First, a unique context. It's extremely populated. It's the interface of huge geopolitical powers, China, India, Japan. It's one of the most disaster-prone areas of the, on the planet and so has a huge need for space technologies. It has various connectivity challenges, both on the ground and uh, at sea. And the positive point is that it has a huge economic potential. The other unique situation is regarding space development. There are 10 countries in ASEAN. Uh, four countries have a space program, four do not. One is in transition, and was in one um, Singapore is quite unique because it's mostly commercial and academic. And finally, ASEAN itself is an interesting uh, structure, a political, regional political alliance with its own uh, goals and priorities. So this is a of course, simplified um, comparison of uh, the situation of ASEAN countries regarding space. So you have the 10 ASEAN countries, some elements about their space program, space agency, and national uh, space policy. So 
just to simplify the situation in these countries, I will outline a few interesting points. Let's start with Indonesia. Um, Indonesia in green, so a country, uh, sorry, let me explain the colors first. In green are the countries with an established space program. In red are countries with absolutely no space program. In orange, the Philippines is a country in transition, having recently established uh, a space agency two months ago, in August 2019. And Singapore is this unique case that I will comment uh, shortly. So Indonesia, uh, many of you may not know, but it's a very old space program. They had their space agency, LAPAN, in 1963. It's one of the first space agencies in the world. And as Professor von der Dunk showed in his slides, they have a very comprehensive space policy. So they are a very interesting example of a quite successful and ancient uh, space program. Vietnam has an interesting aspect, the last line, because they had the first Asian astronaut, or I should say cosmonaut, because it was with the USSR as early as 1980. Thailand and Malaysia, the two other big space powers in ASEAN, have one common point, which is that they started their space programs with communication satellites that were just uh, purchased from abroad, basically turnkey satellites. And so when they started in the 90s, it, has very, it had very limited impact on national capacity building. And they had to wait the 2000 and the establishment of national space agencies to really engage in national capacity building. The fourth element I would like to mention is Philippines. Um, for those interested in witnessing the creation of a space program, Philippines is a great example. Uh, they have been working since 2015 to draft a national law that is very interesting, very comprehensive, so I encourage you to read it. And it was uh, accepted by the House and the Senate uh, in, on the last August. Singapore, as I said, very unique case. The program is not a government program. There is an association called SSTA that kind of coordinate efforts at national level, but, it's, but all space activities are done by the private sector, for example, ST Electronics, or very powerful universities, such as the Nanyang Technological University or the National University of Singapore. And finally, because I'm running out of time, Laos and Cambodia are countries with no real space capabilities, except communication satellite that were developed through collaboration with China. So it's Chinese, basically, development aid through the China Great Wall Industry Corporation. You may have heard of it. Um, just to finish, if you're interested in more, a bit of advertisement, I'm currently editing a volume for Springer on the history, comprehensive history of ASEAN Space Program. It's the first book on this topic. And the authors are prominent actors in each of the countries. So it's, I can promise you it's very interesting. So please keep in mind next year to check this book. Thank you very much. Thank you. So because of time restriction, I'd like to ask one each, one comment concerning the space governance study, the importance or the role of a space agency or a challenge of space law. So France, please. Um, obviously, the, the role of space agencies is crucial in that, but as a lawyer, I'm then, of course, always tempted to seek out what is the space agency charged to do. And there you see a whole gamut from uh, space agencies which are basically charged to conduct the state's space program and, and the National Aeronautics and Space Agency and JAXA are two prominent examples thereof. And you have also space agencies which have a fundamentally different role. They are charged by the government to actually monitor, govern, if you will, authorize and supervise the private sector. And that, of course, and some of, sometimes they even go together. In, in, in France, CNES has basically a double role. And that is, of course, of key importance. If you, if, you, if you want to actually drive your country forward as, uh, in terms of space activities and you want to include the private sector, then I think the role of the space agency should not be limited only to undertaking civil governmental space activity, but also monitoring, supervising, controlling, and at the same time, of course, stimulating and engaging the private industry sector. Yeah, I think... Uh uh, governance of space is going to be very crucial in the coming years. Uh, one, because uh, we are all embarking on very new things. Uh, many of the issues are not yet well defined and crystallized into accepted sort of policy. So governance is going to be very important. But when you talk of governance, I feel that 
the role of development under governance and role of regulation under governance will, will, will have to be very clearly defined. So a national space agency may develop the technologies and develop the, the support that is required for governing space in the overall sense. But regulating it, uh, you know, setting up the rules and everybody following those rules that are required, I think will, will be a very different set of activities, maybe done by some other agency in that sense. So regulation also is going to be very key, apart from in, in the overall framework of governance. And uh, how we do it is going to depend upon many studies that will have to be done and, and uh, accepted at the national level and also at the international level. So I, I would comment on the role of space agencies and continuing on what I presented from the point of view of these emerging uh, space nations uh, that I interact with in Asia Pacific and, and in Africa. For me, the main role is, there are two main roles. One is risk taking. So taking the risk that the industry in this country are, is not willing to take. But it's, it's true in many countries, but in particular in these countries. And the second role that is the most important is creating the conditions for capacity building, acquiring and retaining the knowledge, which is something that the, the industry in this country cannot do and doesn't do. And the example I showed before about Thailand and Malaysia, when Thailand purchased Thaicom in the 90s, there was literally no capacity building after that. So it was not really useful for the country, apart from the communication services themselves. And it's only when GISDA was created in the 2000s that they could leverage the different actors in the country, the universities, the private sector, the research institute, and really create some capacity inside Thailand. So creating capacity building is the most important. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in, uh, in on my uh, presentation, uh, Deep Space Gateway is a uh, uh, kind of uh, infrastructure for uh, uh, nowadays space, global space activities, uh, maybe. And uh, as for the um, uh, infrastructure, uh, personally, I'm interested in uh, space port, too. Uh, so uh, maybe the um, space agency uh, can contribute to uh, establishing the space port with uh, their knowledge uh, or expertise. Uh, in the United States, uh, there are many space ports established across the uh, uh, states, but uh, uh, in Japan, uh, we, we don't have uh, such space ports, so uh, space port is one of the uh, uh, options uh, to develop. Thank you. So as a con conclusion of panel discussion, I'd like to point out three points. One is uh, as a, uh, uh, the gov uh, governance study, uh, comparative, com comparative study. Uh, we, a Japanese space agency, and then Jap uh, we can learn many things, uh, such as uh, space agency law, and then the uh, good practices of regulation all over the world. That is a good point for us. And second point is like France uh, pointed out, there are still many countries has doesn't uh, uh, doesn't have the, its domestic law regulation. So like space debris may, against measures for space debris, uh, including Japan, uh, we are now have licensing regime including regu uh, reg uh, restriction for space debris. Uh, issues. So uh, we need more and more country have more uh, uh, more uh, sense uh, more, more uh, domestic laws uh, for the sustainable uh, activity of space space activities. So we can promote such kind of uh, <laughs> concern uh, for the country which that which still doesn't have the uh, sp uh, domestic space laws and third. Third good thing is uh, this is the group of not only from a space agency but the academic side. We can discuss very flexibility uh, with, with flexible, uh, so we can propose uh, good governance or even like uh, Mukund proposed, we can we can propose uh, some uh, future as a cooperation among the each country. That is good uh, good uh, things of the kind of. Uh, communication between not only uh, space agency side, but on the academic side and the industry side is a good thing. So we would like to uh, continue such kind of activities. So I, I'm very sorry, uh, we cannot uh, get the question from the, uh, from the uh, audience, so maybe later uh, 
please come to us. So sorry. So that, that's the conclusion of the discussion. So finally, the closing remarks from the Mukundo for the. I think, uh, uh, in conclusion, I can only say one thing that um, uh, space policy and law is going to be a very uh, active field. And we need uh, good academicians, we need uh, good support from the industry and from the national space agencies. And I think all, all will have to put their heads together to, to look at policy issues on a continuous basis in the future. Uh, fora like this are very good and we must uh, thank uh, uh, JAXA and University of Tokyo for organizing this and also thank all the panelists uh, who have come in here, uh, apart from the audience who have been sitting patiently and hearing to this particular thing. So I'm sure that uh, these discussions will help in, in, in a better understanding of the policy issues and the law issues at the national level, at the regional level, and at the international level. Thank you. Thank you very much.